All right, let's do this. Oh God, my camera's still not right in the corner. Let me fix that quickly. There we go. This is what I'm going to be working on tonight. This little thing. Hope you guys are all right. Here we've got here. We've got uh, Fistmaster 2K4, uh, Barmud, and Steps as well. Hi guys. Um. Yeah, Game Boy. So it's been something I've been wanting to do for a while. I need to learn a little bit of Z80, uh, even though it's not really Z80. It's like a bastard child of Z80 and 8080. Um, and it just seemed like a good piece of hardware to try it on. Um, it's quite a powerful piece of hardware. It's got. Um, I'm, I'm going for Game Boy Color, by the way. I know this is a Game Boy Advance, but um, I'm going for Game Boy Color. Um, but it's still a powerful piece of hardware, it's got some nice stuff in it, it's got good sprites, good sound. Um, so yeah, it's pretty pretty good. So I'll, I'll start off by just showing you um, what I've been working on today and tonight. Oh yeah, Iron Brew. I've given up on the sprite sponsorship, so I'm going with Iron Brew instead. So Yeah, this is VS Code. So this is what I generally use for my day-to-day my -day work. Um, and this is kind of what I do in my day-to-day, -day, a lot of React and um, an Electron. Uh, so I've been making, um, so let me show you the tools that are there already. So this is what, uh, this is kind of the best tool out there, apparently, um, for doing Game Boy stuff. Um, unfortunately, I lost the file that I, I spent ages making so um, I've only got this one so this is, is this is what it lets you do it lets you kind of edit blocks like this and kind of mess around with the palettes but what I didn't like about this is that I can't I have to view the whole of the tile map in whatever palette I select here I can't assign individual pieces to different palettes um, there's also no um, decent screen maker so there is this thing which kind of lets you put individual blocks all over the place and it does let you assign palettes to these as well as you draw them um, but it doesn't have uh, kind of meta tile features which is what I wanted so um, I've been looking at trying to make something that kind of combines the best of Charpad with um, um, with, with kind of with Game Boy stuff so let me just if I just save this it should load up so I've only spent a couple of hours on it this this evening um, but I've already got um, a way to load in uh, a tile map so I can load a tile map in um, and I can set individual palettes on things so if I if I come here uh, it is using RGB uh, full full 8-bit RGB um, or 24-bit if you like um, as opposed to the 15 bit RGB, which I'll explain in a minute when I go through the hardware, but it should be fairly easy to convert these down um, to the uh, to the Game Boy version. that will be close enough for, for what I need, so I can quite easily kind of change the color palette of just one area, um, or I can change. Uh, so this is all in palette one at the moment. I'll explain how the palettes work um, as well in a minute. And that's basically what I've been doing. I've been trying to figure out two things. One, how I'm going to actually create assets. Um, two, how the actual hardware itself works. Uh, that's fine. There you go. So you can create create it all in this, and then you can kind of you can change your palette for just one area if you want to. Um, and so that's what this tool is going to be. It's going to be a very very simple. Um, uh, tile editor you can have meta tiles down here and then you can have a map editor here you can be able to uh, you're going to be able to make multiple um, maps as well so you'll be able to join several screens together and you'll be able to, if you've used the um, thalamus char pad edition um, you'll be able to do the um, oh God, what's it called in that uh, flexi tiles or something so you'll be able to you'll be able to divide the map up into segments um, of the same size and then export them as individual levels. Is this a tool I'll be releasing? Yeah, I can release it when it's done. Um, it should be 
should be relatively easy to, to port um, to different platforms. It's all done in React, so an Electron, so it should should just work um, on different platforms out of the box, really. So, uh, but yeah, you can see it's it's already kind of fairly decent. Um, I need to work on the saving. I haven't got any save feature in there at all yet. Um, I've just been working on getting this this area working and the palettes working. <clears throat> Acorn Electron version one. Yeah. The cool thing with this is you could technically use this to do um, NES graphics as well. Um, just by changing the exporter, you could use it to do uh, CPC as well, Amstrad CPC. So you can use it for a few various things. But I'm, I'm writing it specifically for the Game Boy Color at the moment. Um, but there may be options, you know, in here because one of the things I want to be able to do as well, um, and I'll explain a bit more when we get onto how the Game Boy graphics work, um, is these tiles are made up. Um, they, these will be two by two tiles. So two, uh, a meta tile is made up of uh, two. I'm going to call them characters because that's what I'm used to. to uh, two of these character tiles, um, wide and two high. Um, but the Game Boy lets you flip things, so it lets you flip things on the Y axis and on the X axis and assign a different palette to each one. Um, so you'll be able to build them by using combinations of these attributes as well, which should be quite nice. <coughs> um, which means your, your tile, your tile, you should be able to build quite complex tiles out of it, so... Uh, so yeah, Salt probably builds his own in uh, COBOL, yeah, exactly. Um, okay. So that's kind of where I am with that. I'm hoping that I'll have this um, completed by probably the end of the weekend, uh, or at least in a in a very usable state by the end of the weekend. And, uh, and then I might. Um, what I'll probably do is I'll probably use it to write .dot cosmos, and then when when I'm done with .dot cosmos, I'll probably release it as a as a tool for everybody else. Um, um, yeah, I mean, it looks like you can drag these around, but you can't. It's just CSS styling to make the kind of panels look look nice. So, um, uh, cool. All right. Um, so that's where I am with that. This is this is going to be the the, the, the character map. Um, let me show you uh, how I've got it set up. Um, okay. So. <coughs> It's been an interesting um, couple of days trying to figure all this out because um, I've never done Z80 before um, and, <laughs> and I'm learning Z80 in the Game Boy um, version so it's not... <laughs> oh god no I haven't got that turned on ever. I thought I'd turn that off. No. <laughs> um, yeah Z Z80 um, is a, a lot more than what the Game Boy has. The Game Boy has a subset of Z80 and um, plus a few extra features uh, that the Z80 doesn't have. Uh, unfortunately most of the stuff that the Game Boy Z80 have make up for failings that it doesn't pull from the normal Z80. Um, <clears throat> so let's start by uh, talking about the tools that I'm using. So this is VS Code. Um, I think this is, um, for me, it's, it's the best kind of all-in-one ID at the moment. <clears throat> um, it's got good integration with Git, it's got, it's got good extension integration, and one of the things it does have an extension for is this RGBDS. So RGBDS is the set of tools uh, that I'll be using to compile stuff for the Game Boy. Um, so it has a very specific Game Boy Z80 compiler, uh, well, assembler, sorry. Um, as well as a, a, a linker and a fixer. So you can see here in my build file, so I've got a build batch file here. Um, this will, uh, there's just three tools. There's IGBASM, which is the assembler. So this will take the uh, entry file, in our case, main ASM, uh, and build an ob objective file, object files out of it. Um, and then there's the linker, which will turn that into a cartridge format, a, a runnable ROM, basically, that we can put onto onto one of these. So I've got this, um, I don't know if you can see that, it's an easy flash cartridge. Uh, you just load your ROM onto the little SD card in there, as you can see. 
um, and then that will run uh, on the Game Boy Advance. The reason I went for the Game Boy Advance as well is because it will run Game Boy, it will run Game Boy Color, but I also get the advantage of having a Game Boy Advance, and there's some cool Game Boy Advance games out there that I wanted to play, so... <coughs> yeah, I'll go through the specs in a minute as well. Um, and then the third tool is RGB Fix, and what this does is this um, fixes the ROM to do various things, so it makes sure that all your headers are correct, uh, so you get the proper the proper logo boot, which I'll explain in a minute. Um, uh, it also uh, patches the ROM to give you the proper um, banking cartridge. So there's lots of different cartridge types. So there's the, the basic uh, cartridge types, like your Game Boy cartridge types, uh, which generally are just going to be uh, 32 kilobytes. Um, and then there's your Game Boy Advance games, which um, have all sorts of weird... Um, and wonderful uh, settings on them. I don't actually have any Game Boy Color carts in here, um, uh, but that's what this uh, RGB fix will do. So, uh, cool. All right, let's let's quickly explain the, the specs of the Game Boy as well. So, um, again, we're looking at. Um, we're looking at Game Boy Advance, but um, the Game Boy Color um, that that is that runs on this runs on a, a special Z80 chip um, by Sharp. Um, as I say, it's kind of based loosely on the Z80 and the 8080. It's kind of somewhere in the middle of the two. Uh, it's got a few extra commands that that neither of the other two have, and it's missing a lot from particularly the the Z80. It's closer to the 8080 than it is to the Z80. Um, the CPU on the Game Boy Color runs at 4 megahertz or 8 megahertz if you put it into turbo mode, which is obviously a battery drain, so you want to be careful using that. If you don't need it, don't use it. Um, uh, 3.8 megahertz, but still apparently slower. Than, yes. So the problem that the, the problem that it has is that Z80 commands are quite cycle heavy. Uh, so the smallest uh, command I think is four cycles. Uh, as opposed to two on the um, on the six five zero two, and to do many things, you need to move. You need to shuffle stuff around quite a lot. So you'll see in my code um, lots of these load commands. That's because pretty much everything you want to do is done with these load commands. Um, so sometimes it can be um, a bit cumbersome trying to achieve the same things in six five zero two. I'm very very new to Z eighty, so for me this is all. Um, still kind of a little bit of black magic. I don't quite know what's going on uh, in some cases. I kind of get most of this now. This is quite basic stuff. Um, but as you'll see, there's there's other stuff which kind of confuses me now and again. And I'm sure I could do a lot of this quicker as well. Um, in fact, I'm not even sure what this is doing. I think I was just messing around with some stuff here. Yeah, I was messing around with some stuff. Uh, I probably need to revert that at some point. I'll, I'll go through that in a minute. <coughs> <coughs> so the screen resolution on the Game Boy Color is uh, 160 by 144, which is quite small. Um, I mean, it's less than a quarter of the C64 resolution, uh, but it is two bits per pixel, so that means um, multicolor mode uh, is always active. Um, you can have four colors in any 8x8 pixel block. Um, and you don't need double wide pixels like you do on the C64. Uh, that does, however, mean that the um, the 8x8 block of uh, pixels takes 16 bytes as opposed to 8 bytes. So on the C64, you just have 8 bytes, one for each row of pixels. Um, but on the Game Boy and, and any two bits per pixel system, you'll have two bytes uh, for every line uh, because every single pixel consists of two bits. Um, so you can have a number from 0 to 3, which um, define the colour that you use. Um, it's a palette-based system, so that means that um, you define a number from 0 to 3, and that points to a, an index in a palette. Just turn that music down, it's quite loud. Um, that points to um, a colour in a palette, and you can have 8 palettes for the background. Uh, I'm not sure what you can have for the spice, I think it's 8 as well. Um, and you can define those eight palettes out of uh, 
you can have any of 32,000 colours, so it's RGB 555, that means um, you basically you have red, green and blue and you can define numbers from 0 to 31 for each of those. Um, it also has some other nice features as well, so it has hardware scrolling built in. Um, so while the, the viewport is uh, 20 characters by 18 characters high, um, the actual the actual screen RAM is 32 by 32 characters, so the screen RAM is actually 256 bytes. Um, and you have a viewport window which you can move around inside there uh, in, um, in very kind of... Um, you, you've got fine control over it, you can move it a pixel at a time. Um, so that's kind of nice, that makes, that makes scrolling very very easy to do. Um, yeah, 15-bit color. So it, every palette entry takes uh, two bytes. You have uh, the the very upper bit of the second byte is is unused, and then you have a group of five bits at a time. So it goes from uh, starting from the most significant bits. It goes uh, uh, blue, green, red, five five bits at a time. Um, so the other interesting thing about uh, this system compared to the Commodore is the way that memory works. So um, one of the things that took me a little while to get the... Um, can you use the extra bit for game data? Um, you probably could, but I mean, it's not going to be that useful. <laughs> uh, it's going to be slotting, because the pallets can be anywhere, you see. So um, I'll explain how the pallets work, because that was another thing that took me a long time uh, to figure out because uh, it's a very unusual system for defining the palettes. Um, so yeah, the other interesting thing is the way the memory works. So let me just bring up a memory map for the Game Boy Color. Uh, see if I can find one that's a picture rather than... Uh, yeah, that'll do. No, that's give me the there we go. So this is the, the memory map for the Game Boy Color. Um, so you have technically 64 um, kilobytes of addressable uh, ROM and RAM. Um, now, if it's ROM, it's always ROM. If it's RAM, it's always RAM, um, and you, that can't be changed. But what you can do is you can bank some things in. Um, so what that means is um, one of the things we get used to doing quite a lot on the C64 is writing all our code in, into RAM. We never actually write into ROM. The only time you actually have anything on ROM is when you run from a cartridge. And even then, you tend to copy it into RAM and, and run it there. <coughs> so what that means is you can't uh, do self-modifying code in the same way um, if you if you have code running in the ROM banks. You do have some internal RAM here, um, but you can't load stuff directly into that. You have to copy it from ROM into RAM. Thank you for the follow, Ginger Train. Welcome to the stream. Um, so that was that was my first pitfall. Is I was trying to store variables in the middle of my code. Um, and they weren't being written because they were in ROM, so whatever I wrote there would just get ignored. Um, I, in fact, it wasn't being ignored, it was doing something completely different, which I'll explain in a, in a minute. Um, and so what you have to do is you have to use this internal RAM here, which is at C000, uh, to do these things. Uh, and so for that I do have... Um, I have this file called RAM. And what you can do is you can, I'll, I'll explain the sections in a minute, um, you can define kind of, so this is, I've, I've got a temp variable, I'm assigning one blank byte to it. Um, if I do that it becomes two bytes, four bytes and so on. Uh, and that just means that's up in, in RAM and I can change, I can write to that and I can change that. Um, the other interesting thing is you have this switchable ROM bank here. Um, so you might look at this and think, oh, you've only got room for 32 kilobytes of code. And actually, you've got less than that, because you need to store all your, um, all your graphics in here, um, all your, you know, your fonts, your sprites, your screens, your maps, uh, even your sound and music all need to go into this area here. And then you need to copy it into the video RAM at startup. Um, so the video RAM consists of um, sprite bank, uh, character bank, screen RAM, um, and sprite RAM, 
uh, I've said Spark Run, haven't I? Yeah. Um, and it's empty when you start, so you have to copy these things in. Actually, it's not empty, it has the Nintendo logo in it. <clears throat> but you have to copy them in from here. So this bank here from 4000 to 7 FFF is used um, by the cartridges to bank stuff in. So what this lets you do is say you've got, um, I mean, this isn't, this is a Game Boy one, but say you've got a, a 2 megabyte cartridge. Uh, what you can do is you can swap this ROM out with any other part of the, the cartridge. Um, and that's where I'm doing I'm doing that here. So uh, ROM extra uh, bank one. Um, so actually bank one is by default the, the initial one that loads in. Um, so if you look at this, this ROM here is bank zero. This can never be banked out. It's always banked in. Uh, the default here is bank one is banked in. And then if your cartridge allows additional banks, you can store them um, all the way up to, I think, bank 128. Um, it gives you about, I think it's 128, might be 128, yeah, 128. That's a two megabyte cartridge, and that's that's a hell of a lot, um, hell of a lot of room, so um, you can do a lot with that. Um, so what you would tend to do, I, I guess, and again, I'm guessing here, because I haven't really done anything um, of note on this yet, um, is you would have your kind of main loop code in here um, and then you would switch stuff in that was either code that just very quickly needs to do you can bank in you can run it and then bank it out again or more likely your things like your fonts your sprite definitions your maps your music would be in this switchable ROM bank and you would copy it into the areas that you need um, as you go on um, you also have switchable RAM as well um, so this is so you do have your internal RAM. This is always active. Then you have this switchable RAM. So this is used by uh, battery backup um, cartridges. Um, I'm not sure entirely how it works, but I imagine you can bank in uh, another RAM, another RAM bank, um, and it will be saved um, by the battery backup on it. it it's basically non-volatile RAM. Um, uh, Okay, cool, that's that's that. Video RAM I'll go into in a little bit more detail later. Apparently this area here, the way it says unusable, is just a copy of your normal RAM or something. It's like a shadow of it. Um, so reading from here is likely to give you stuff from your internal RAM. Writing to here probably doesn't do anything or, or, or it will just write to here. Uh, I've, I've, again, I've not experimented with that. Um, sprite attributes, this is similar to the I.O. RAM, uh, the I.O. area in uh, the C64, so the first uh, 32 bytes of D00 to D020. Um, it also contains the sprite pointers in here, and this has enough definitions for 40 sprites. Um, basically, every sprite has four uh, bytes with it. It has an X and a Y position. Um, it has um, an, X and a, an X and a Y position. And then two other things. What are the other things? I can't remember what they are. One's an attribute, uh, which lists things like which palette to use, whether it should be flipped left or right, up or down, um, whether it should be behind the background or in front of the background. Oh, and the third one is a pointer. The third one is the pointer, which tells it where to draw, uh, where to get the data from in video RAM. Um, then there's some more unusable RAM here. Again, the wasteful. Uh, and then there's uh, FF0 to FF4B. So this is the IO RAM. This is kind of like the other areas of um, of D00 on the C64 onwards. So this contains things like your sound registers, um, your raster line. Um, uh, what else is in here? The palette stuff is in here as well. Um, there's a few things in here. I'll, I'll put some links in a minute to... Um, to some stuff uh, that, that I've been using to look so it took me a while to find a decent kind of memory map for these things uh, for the IRA. In fact I'll do that now. So this is uh, this is the doc I've been looking at. This contains most of this same information but it has some really good information about the um, the IO RAM um, in particular things like scroll registers. Um, so for instance you set these two values and you can scroll a map around and I'll show you how that works in a minute in the emulator. Um, as well as kind of other stuff. So I'll put a link to that in chat now. 
that's the closest I've found to uh, a decent kind of memory map. And I like this one because it actually tells you what every single bit does, whereas other ones, other tutorials just say, oh, just set this to that, set this bit to on, and that will be enough. Whereas this actually explains what every bit does, so you're not, you're not just randomly turning bits on because you've been told to do that. I'm just going to turn the, the exposure on my camera down because I'm glowing like crazy. Uh, and then you've got high RAM, and high RAM is kind of like zero page. There's a special set of registers on, in GBZ80, um, a, a special set of um, in, uh, op codes in Z80 that deal with writing to this area. So what the assembler will do is anytime you write something into this area, it will write something which is quite similar to a zero page instruction um, in that it's, um, it uses less bytes to, to actually write the opcode. Um, uh, because you're only writing an offset from this position, so it only uses one byte for your address, uh, and the instructions are quicker as well. So this this high RAM is is kind of like zero page. <coughs> you just ran. Well, what I mean by that is you you read a tutorial and it will say like, oh, you need to turn the screen off, so you just need to turn bit five off of this address, and they tell you that bit five turns the screen off, but they don't tell you anything else about that address. Whereas this this page actually tells you everything, so <laughs> yeah, and you you do exactly that. <laughs> so let me just check my messages. Okay, oh, good. Um, yeah, so that's that's kind of the memory map layer, and it took me a while to figure this out. Um, one of the first things you have to figure out is is how does your program start? And every um, every Game Boy ROM starts with uh, it's about uh, 208 bits, 208 bytes of header, um, which is this here. Um, so what you can do is you can skip most of the header out because the back the batch file here, this RGB fix, fills it in for you. Uh, but what you do need to put in is your entry point. Um, your entry point is always at 100. Uh, so what happens when you start the cartridge up? Um, let's do it with the game now, actually. Actually, it's, this is this isn't Game Boy. Let's imagine this was the Game Boy Color. So on the Game Boy Color, you would have the Nintendo logo on here, um, on on here, and that's what is it at this location at zero. There's, what's at 0 to 100 is some code that displays the Nintendo logo uh, and plays the little sound. Um, then when it's done with that, it jumps to 100, um, where you have 4 bytes, um, which is your entry point. And so what you tend to do with the 4 bytes is you... Um, I'm disabling interrupts. Um, I've seen NOP here instead, uh, but I, I, I'm using disable interrupts. Uh, because I've been told to do that uh, and then a jump to my start location and then you need to fill in up to 150 with blank um, and then you can put your code in after that now one thing about this assembler is you can't once once you start a section you can't kind of fill it, it won't automatically fill the gaps in for you so you have to kind of do it using this repeat uh, thing. This is the only place you really need to do it, and then, then from this point on you can just kind of stack the code on top of it, each other. Um, and that's what these, these sections do, they basically tell the assembler um, what kind of, it, it gives it a label, um, as, as you would do with the, uh, the uh, origin instructions in Kick Assembler, and tells it which bank and which, uh, which memory type you're loading it into. Um, You've got includes, which are just the same as imports. Um, so I'm including some stuff up here. I'm going to get rid of this one. This is one that um, one of the tutorials give you, um, and all it does is give you a load of kind of memory addresses, give names to them. And I actually don't like that. I'd rather just learn what the what the addresses are. I find it a bit easier to deal with that way. Um, and then you can include stuff you want in any order. Um, it's fine. 
so let's talk a little bit about the video then. Let me just let me just turn this weird loop that I've got off here. I think it's that, isn't it? And then that, that's what I have. Let's see if this works. It does work, okay. Um, so to do a test, I, I, I just wanted to make sure that I could draw some tiles to the screen um, and move them around. So this is the simple thing. I can't actually, can I make it? Yeah, I can make it bigger later. And this is the emulator I use. It's called BGB. It's pretty good. Um, it has a fairly decent debugger built into it. Um, so you can see everything that's going on in, in the different areas of memory. And it labels the, the memory locations as well, so you know that they're ROM and RAM and that you can write to them or not write to them. Uh, so that's kind of cool. Um, but the most, the most important thing I think in here is going to be the VRAM view and this lets you see exactly what your tiles are, where they're loaded in. So this is, this is bank 0 VRAM and this is bank 1 VRAM which I'll explain in a second. Um, you can see the sprite maps in here. Uh, these are the sprite attributes. The, the sprites themselves are actually in this location along with the tiles. They kind of share a bit of the same area. Uh, and then you can see the palettes as well that have been defined. Uh, so yeah, it does look like you can have eight palettes for, for sprites. So you get eight palettes for uh, background tiles. Uh, so that means if you don't do any palette trickery with the rasters, you can have up to 32 colors in the background um, on screen at one time with uh, any four from one palette in, in any single square. So you can see here they've got these characters. So this is the exact font from Dot .cosmos uh, and it's being drawn with uh, four colors, blue for a background, uh, and then three colours in, in kind of bands as it goes down. Um, but this bit's really cool. So this BG map actually shows you um, how the scroll works. So you can see we're not actually moving any of that text. What we're doing is we're drawing it all to, uh, to the video RAM. And then this window is the scroll window. So this shows us um, we can set a register um, up in, I think it's FF. Or one or two or something like that. I can't even remember what, what the addresses are. I don't, don't memorize them at all yet. Um, and you can move that window around. And so this is how you do scrolling on the Game Boy. Uh, what it also means is you've got a lot more room to draw stuff. So if you are worried that you're not going to have enough time, you've got all of this gap here to draw new data in. Uh, likewise at the bottom, you've got a big gap down here to draw data in. So um, plenty of room and the CPU is technically a little bit faster for, for drawing these things as well um, plus you've got less to draw you've only got 18 rows of characters and, and 20 uh, columns of characters as opposed to 40 and 25 um, so color RAM works a little bit differently um, to the CC24 it's similar in a way in that you have an area of memory which is this this block here which is your, your screen RAM. So this is 32 across by 32 down. It's exactly 256 bytes, which I'm guessing is why they, they chose this size, because it's a nice convenient size. Um, you can define where in memory that goes. There are two locations it can go, um, I think. Maybe, might be more, but I think it's two. Um, so it either goes uh, uh, 9800, no, I think it's more actually. Anyway, you can, you can define where in memory that goes, but one, once it's there, um, that's your screen RAM, and that's always going to be in um, the main VRAM. <coughs> uh, let me just bring up this window a second. Oh, there we go. Um, where was my other memory? Yeah, so, so this is in video RAM here. Now, video RAM has two banks as well on the Game Boy Color. On the normal Game Boy, you just have one video RAM and it just looks like this and you have a single palette. Everything uses the same palette. Uh, you, can, you can switch the colors around in the palette, but you can't, you can't assign different palettes to different areas of the screen. You just have one, one palette, I believe. I think you can do it with sprites, but you can't do it with the background. Um, you could do some palette trickery with the raster as it moves down the screen, but if you don't use any trickery, you're just going to have the same palette all over the screen. On the Game Boy Color, you have two video RAMs. So you have um, you have your, your standard video RAM, Bank 0, VRAM 0, and then you have VRAM 1. And VRAM 1 um, 
is this side here. Um, so what that gives you is gives you more tiles, more sprites, but more importantly it gives you some extra screens. Except they're not screens like this, they're the colour ramp. And the way it works is um, it's kind of like a tile attribute system. So you can change a value in, in the second bank um, and have these tiles flip. Um, you can change the palette on any individual tile. So it's kind, it works kind of like the colour ramp. You set a value in it and it changes the attributes for that tile on the screen. Um, but you can change palettes individually. And so that's what I'm trying to do with, with that tool that I'm writing. Um, I'm trying to create something that allows me to um, uh, it allows me to <clears throat> to define a list of tiles for for a map along with the the attributes that make the the different colors up. Oh, there you can see the different maps. So we've got a map at nine eight hundred nine c hundred uh, and tiles. You can move where the tiles are as well. So you can see there's different locations for. The screen so there's two locations for the screen and two locations for the tiles <clears throat> so the other thing to bear in mind as well is that there is enough room for uh, I think 256 sprite definitions and 256 uh, tile definitions in each bank um, however if you look this is 256 uh, which only leaves one to eight so they have to overlap so they can either completely overlap or they, they can overlap half and half. Um, probably not a problem. You can either go with 128 sprites and 256 characters or vice versa, or you can have some sprites and characters that share some data. Um, on the Game Boy Color, you obviously you increase the number uh, that you've got here. And one of the attributes in the sprites and the tiles is which VRAM bank you pull that tile from. So what I'm gonna do in .cosmos is I'm gonna have the, um, the, the two different timelines stored in different banks pardon me so what I'll be able to do is is basically just flip a bit um, in in the attribute bank like the color ramp uh, and it switch the tile to um, to the old style as well as the palette as well I'll be able to switch the palette so just by writing one value I'll be able to change a single tile on screen to old or new um, uh, okay cool uh, I think that's explained most of the hardware stuff. Um, oh, sprites. So sprites, you get 40 sprites. Uh, you can have 10 sprites on, on, on a line, 40 total on the screen. Uh, the sprites are 8x8 or 8x16. I believe if you do 8x16, you'll only get 20 sprites. Um, so it's basically automatically stacking them. Uh, most games used 8x8 and stacked them as they needed because um, sometimes you don't need more than 8x8, sometimes you need 16x16, 16 16, sometimes you need 8x16. So it was just easier for developers to write their own kind of sprite stacking system. Um, sprite priorities work a little bit differently to uh, the C64. So on the C64, Sprite 0 will always be at the front uh, of the other sprites, um, ignoring the priority for the background. If you just stacked all the sprites on top of each other, Sprite 0 would always be on the top. Oh yeah, the window as well. Um, on the Game Boy, it's a little bit different. So, on the Game Boy, um, it's not to do with the sprite number, but to do with the sprite's position horizontally across the screen. So, if you've got a sprite over the left-hand side of the screen and a sprite over the right, and they move together, the one on the right will appear behind. <laughs> Thanks for the bits, Hayes. That's a cool looking rainbow reindeer unicorn, whatever it is. Gunstar Heroes is annoying to <laughs> him. That's his job, that's what he does. Um, okay, yeah, there is there is one other screen type, it's called the window. Um, actually, can you see it in here? I'm not sure you can see it in here. Well, I haven't got it enabled. So um, what you'll see in lots of games is a head-up display, uh, you know, some kind of score panel at the bottom or at the side. You'll also see little kind of pop-up windows with text appearing in them. Uh, and that's another kind of win uh, another screen area, if you like. Um, now, the screen area, you can't scroll this area, but what you can do is you can define whether it's on or off and where it begins drawing on the screen. So it draws on, on character boundaries, I believe. Um, 
it might be on pixel boundaries I don't know but um, basically you define where the top left of that window is um, and the contents of it and then it will draw it so it means you can draw a kind of panel down the side panel across the bottom uh, pop-up window in the middle if you want um, you can use it for you can use it for lots of things um, and I'll be making use of that for the dialogues I think um, I've, again, I've not really looked into the window stuff yet, but I'm guessing it's quite simple uh, compared to the rest of it. Um, oh, one thing I, I'm going to explain is the way the palettes work. So, the palettes aren't, you can't technically read what's in, the, or at least I've not found a way to read um, what's in the palettes directly. Um, I think you could probably can do it, but they, they don't just live in somewhere in ROM or RAM like you would expect. What you have is you have this register. Um, if you look in the specifications, uh, where is it? It's really annoying, this one here. So you have this register FF6A, um, and what you have to do is you, you tell FF6A um, where you're going to start writing data to. So you, you basically have um, 32 colors spread over eight uh, eight palettes four colors um, four colors per palette and each color um, each palette entry if you like um, consists of two bytes so you have a total of 64 bytes that, that basically make up your palettes um, for, for both sprites and for background objects um, I, I believe the, the system is the same for um, for object palettes as well but I'm just going to explain um, it from the point of view of the background because that's what I, I did first so what you do is you you basically you write a value to FF6A and this value has um, whereabouts in your palette index you want to start writing um, and this is this is on byte boundaries this, this isn't on um, this isn't on word boundaries like you would expect a palette to be this is on byte boundaries so if you want to write stuff to palette one, you would, uh, to the first palette you would start at index zero. If you want to write stuff to the next palette, you would start at byte um, eight because you need to go four colors along, two bytes each, eight, and so on and so on. You write that value into there and you set bit seven, um, which increments. Maybe I, maybe I should show you what I've done. It's probably easier. Again, though, if you don't know Z80, this is probably going to look just super confusing. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I'm trying to set the, the colors for two different palettes here. Uh, so palette 0 and palette 7. Um, and so I'm going to load the, um, the address of the palettes, which is these things here. It's the same palette for both. Um, and then I call uh, and load C with the, the palette index, and then I call this set palette. And then what that does is it, it's going to load um, load the value from here, load one byte from here, put it into the accumulator, and then put it into E, which is really annoying. I can't just load it directly into E. I'm not sure why. I think it's because I'm using this increment instruction. Um, and then the same again for D. Um, and then basically once you write that to FF68 the next thing you write uh, into FF69 which is the next uh, number across gets put into the palette and that where that palette is I have no idea I'm not entirely sure where that is in memory but I know that writing to these addresses fills that value in I don't think it yet data in palette memory cannot be read written during the time um, yeah, you can actually read the data from here, but it's, this is like a this is like an indirect lookup to the palette tables. So right into this value over and over again actually puts values into a palette table somewhere, um, somewhere in the memory controller, I guess. Um, and reading from it can do the same thing. So palette palette setting took me a while to figure out. Uh, thank you for the follow, Retro Six Eight Six. Welcome to the stream, dude. Yeah, so so that was really awkward, actually. Um, so if anybody does do this and want to get into this and, and is struggling with that, let me know, and I'll I'll kind of talk you through what I figured out um, going through this. Um, 
so I've, I've built this based on bits of code that I pulled from various um, tutorials um, plus just kind of messing around a little bit and just trying to see how things work um, stuff I haven't looked into yet as like I said I haven't looked at the uh, the window layer yet to see how that works I haven't looked at sprites yet um, I wanted to get the background stuff going because that's kind of the kind of the core really of, of the games if you don't get the background layer going then you've not got anything um, and it's the easiest way to get something up and run and display um, display my tiles and display my palettes and stuff uh, okay I think that pretty much covers the, the RAM for now anyway um, but yeah this this debugger is pretty good I, I'm, I'm quite pleased that there is a decent emulator for it that lets you do uh, let's see. Oh, there you go. Window size. Oh no, that's that's not a window. It's something else. Uh, yeah, it doesn't have any anything extra on here. Yeah, right there. Um, and this this will this uh, assembler will let you write Game Boy and Game Boy Color games. Um, I'm targeting Game Boy Color specifically. Um, the reason being is because the effect that I'm using in the game is going to switch between color mode and original Game Boy mode. Uh, and if you just have the original Game Boy, you're going to completely lose that effect, and it's not it's not going to it's not going to work at all. It's not going to look right. Plus, I, I could do with the the extra memory, I think. So, um, all right, I'm going to take a quick break. Then when I come back, I'm going to go through. Um, my code setup, um, what, and basically what what I think I've got working, um, and then I guess anybody who's done done this can tell me if I'm doing things the long way around or um, or I'm doing it correctly. Uh, as I say, this is the first Z80 I've ever written, so it's um, <laughs> it's been it's been a learning experience. I don't like Z80. I've got to say, 6502 is much much nicer. Um, it's easier to read as well. I think it's it's really messy looking codes at 80. But I, I guess it's just because I'm not used to it. So I guess if I got used to it, I'd be fine. Um, all right, I'm going to take a quick two minute break, guys. And when I come back, I will go through some of the code. And I'll try and explain what I've done if I can remember what I've done. Um, all right, uh, I'm back. Hey, Red Show 686. Yeah, I did go with RGB ASM. Um, seem to uh, well rg yeah rgbds or whatever it is um it seemed to be the one most people are using so that's the one i went with um before i go into more detail i just want to explain a little bit about um the the way that the the vram updates um so on the commodore 64 what happens is uh, every eight lines you get a bad line um, and that bad line is fetching the, the character data uh, for the next line. That's not how the Game Boy Color works. The Game Boy Color fetches a single a single line of pixels um, at the beginning of each line. So you have, I, I can't, I don't know the exact cycle numbers, but before, before the, the raster gets to the actual screen. So if you imagine you've got your screen here, the raster kind of starts over here. At this point here, it's fetching the data. Uh, then it moves across the screen, and then you get a big horizontal blank. It's quite large. It's about, in fact, I think it's wider than the screen. So you get more time outside the screen than you do inside the screen. Um, but what that means is you can change values like palettes, um, scroll positions. You can change anything that affects the VRAM in this location, and it will be ready. To, with the new data on the next line instead of every eight lines um, that you get on the Commodore 64. And that's quite powerful. That means you can do some pretty cool stuff. Um, so one thing that you can do is you can... Um, so I watched a video today uh, and I'd already thought about doing uh, a game, well, not actually making a game like this, but I thought about how you would do a racing game, uh, which is you just have um, a single uh, map in your bring up the, the map again so in your uh, in your video RAM in your screen here you'd have a huge kind of road uh, 
that starts with a vanishing point and widens out. Uh, and then you can basically you can use the scroll register to move each line of the road to a different position. So you get a very very um, very kind of you know single pixel precision um, slide of a roll. Um, the pro one of the problems with it is unlike the C64, if the if the PPU, which is the pixel processing unit, is writing anything to the screen, if the pixel processing unit is at this point in the screen, so even though it's not a CRT, um, you can still think of it drawing line by line just like a CRT would. Um, if the pixel processing unit is anywhere in here drawing a line, then writing stuff to the video RAM simply won't work. Um, so you have to wait until you're either in this section here on the on the right hand side of the screen. You also can't write when it's on this side either because it's fetching the data here. Um, if you if you want to change anything on the screen, you have to do it over this side or you have to do it in the V blank. Um, so the V blank is just at the bottom of the screen. It's not at the top like it is on the C64 as well. Um, and it's only 10 lines high. Uh, it's not it's not very big at all. Uh, however, it is quite wide and, and you do get quite a lot of cycles in there. So it sh you should be able to do a lot of stuff in there. Um, <clears throat> feels more like the NES every second. Yeah, I don't know much about the NES architecture, but I'm guessing it's fairly similar, um, but just with Z80. Um, uh, with 6502 instead of Z80. Um, and the reason that's important is it means you can't do things like um, you can't write, you can't move sprite positions while you're in this area of the screen. So you have to do all your kind of sprite movements either in this area here or down in the V blank. However, there are some nice um, routines that you can um, that, that do um, uh, dyna dynamic memory access (DMA) copies. So you can write all your sprite registers. Uh, to an area of memory and then have a single instruction which will copy the lot um, into into sprite registers down at this point. Um, I've not experimented with that yet. I know it exists. Um, I know it's a, it's a Game Boy specific, Game Boy Z80 specific uh, thing, but um, it looks it looks kind of um, kind of useful. Um, I'm really excited about being able to change um, video properties line by line instead of character by character line um, it means you can do kind of quite nice raster effects so you do get raster interrupts as well so you can set raster interrupts just like you would on the commodore that are triggered on various lines as well um, yeah you can double buffer as well so you do have these two screens here as well so you've got a, a map here and a map here and you can use uh, double buffering to switch, switch between the two so when you go down to the v blank you can switch to another one um, which means if you have got some complicated map kind of update routines, you can do it at the bottom. Um, it does also mean that if you want to do kind of animated characters, so if you want to roll the data in here like you do on the Commodore to do things like uh, parallax and stuff like that, you'll have to do it down in V-blank. You can't do it up here. Uh, what we get used to doing on the C64 is racing the raster line. So if the raster line is halfway down the screen, you start doing stuff just behind it. So. So you'd never actually see update until it comes back around again, but you can't do that in the game, but you have to do it at the bottom here. <clears throat> um, I think that's about it. Um, that's kind of what I've learned so far. I'm sure I've got a lot more to learn, um, but it's <clears throat> it's interesting. So it's definitely an interesting architecture. It's going to be good when I get the little map designer up as well. Um, so I, I mean, I've probably seen it from the um, tweet I sent out, but this is the uh, rough design of, of Dock for uh, for Game Boy <clears throat> Game Boy Color. So it uses pretty much the same uh, style as the original uh, original game, but with with a better palette. So we get we get more colors, so that you know these rocks look a little bit more defined. There's no double wide pixels, so everything looks a bit crisper. Uh, you know, we've got nice colours in the in the little bar here and everything. Screen's a bit smaller, so I'm going to have to kind of rework the levels a little bit to the, the screens a little bit. Uh, however, I've got banking as well, so um, 
that means I can have more. So with the original Dot Cosmos, I actually wanted to have 64 screens, but I didn't have enough memory to do it and, and keep it within 16 kilobytes. Um, so I had to I had to kind of skip a few uh, of the screens towards the end. That's why when you get to the last couple of screens on on Dock, it just seems very linear and not much of a challenge at all. That's because I originally had quite a few more extra screens and I had to strip them out. Um, but I'll have I'll have plenty of room to do that in the in this version. So the Game Boy version will be similar to the original, but probably a little bit bigger, a little bit longer, um, and definitely more detail in it as well. Um, I'm not sure whether I'm going to use um, battery backup RAM. I don't see any point in it. I mean, the game is designed to be played kind of in one sitting. Um, you didn't have a save feature on the Commodore, so I don't think I'm going to add one into this. However, I'm going to use um, the kind of the extra power of the Game Boy to do things like add nice backgrounds in and stuff like that. So it's a bit, a bit more varied than, than what you see on the uh, on the C64 version. All right, so let's go. Let's go over the code that I've got. So, so this hardware ink is is basically like the. Um, if you looked at my original code for various projects that I've got on GitHub, you'll you'll know that there's a vic.asm file. Um, this is similar to that. It's one I found online. I can't even remember where I got it from now, but um, basically it has lots of kind of. Um, constant set for various areas in memory but what i don't like about them is they they give them labels like this which means nothing to me um, because i'm not used to the, the game boy so um i'm, I'm gonna stop using this i've, I've started to kind of as you'll see i've started to use the the just the memory address because i for me i i think i learn better if i just know the memory address I know what it does then I don't need to remember the LCD is LCD control I can just I can just figure out what it is and then look at what the bits are and that way I'll understand the hardware a little bit more so uh, I'm probably gonna phase that out at some point so that's the first one I include uh, this has no um, you know nothing uh, it doesn't assemble any bytes anywhere it's just a, a long list of um, a long list of constants basically um, then I have my RAM. Uh, I don't know if important at the top is the right thing to do, but I am going to import it at the top. Uh, this is where I'm just going to store all my variables. So this is kind of like the zero page thing I've got set up, but except it's not zero page. This is just going to be all the variables that I use in the game. Uh, so this is all the stuff I, I need to read and write at runtime. Um, this isn't initialized at runtime, so um, you, you have to do... Um, this ds command which i think is like a reserve reserve a byte or reserved so many bytes if i did this it will reserve four bytes at this location um, basically when i compile this this will become um, c00 and then if i put another if i put another one here temp2 would then be c004 um, so this is just like labels basically i'm just um, i'm just creating creating names for, for labels uh, as I say it doesn't assign anything uh, because it's RAM so it can't it, it doesn't go on to the cartridge it's it's only ROM that gets stored on here so you have to write everything that you need to go into RAM from ROM um, so that means you can't do things like um, DB and then assign a load of bytes that won't work um, you'll get a compile error I need to set my pipeline up because it will still try and run so it's running there but you can see I've got an error here Cannot code, cannot contain code or data. So it's RAM. So I can't. All I can do is reserve bytes, um, and that's it. So I'm just reserving one byte for my temporary variable there. Um, as I go on, this will fill up with with variables for the game. Um, uh, <coughs> I just catch up with the chat. Let me be afraid. Of this. Uh, uh, racing game confirmed. <laughs> so. No, 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 no. They're, all I'm doing, um, all I'm doing uh, for the Game Boy is just just converting the stuff that I've done already as a as a little experiment uh, and something to do on a Tuesday. Um, uh, DS one no DS is is not uh, this is like it saves a number of bytes so that saves four bytes that saves like eight bytes 
16 bytes and so on. It doesn't actually put anything in memory, it just reserves uh, some blank space basically for these things. Um, you would have to put the value, as Atkinfin says, you'd have to put those values into ROM somewhere and then copy them uh, into this area, uh, which I'll show you when we get into the, the assets, um, the asset loading side of things. So assets is, um, let's move this over here. So assets, um, again, you need these to be, um, because it's data that you, um, you, you need to read and then copy into RAM, this needs to be in a ROM bank. Um, so if you use ROMX uh, and then a bank number here, um, you can store this in, in various banks in, in memory. So I'm using, let's go back to this area here. Um, so as I said before, bank zero is where your, your main code uh, starts. This is this is where your boot ROM is. This is where your header is, and this is where your uh, your entry point code is. So this is your entry point code here, which jumps to this location. Um, pretty much, that's the only thing you can do with the entry point because you only have four bytes there. Um, so you just you, you need to waste a uh, waste a byte or use a knob and then jump um, jump to your start location, which this is actually at. Um, 0150. So this is where your code actually begins, um, and that's in this location here in bank zero. So I'm putting all my assets into bank one um, and above. So I've got my character set, which is the uh, character set you can see kind of scrolling across the screen on the the emulator here, um, and I, that gets stored at uh, 4,000 in memory. Um, uh, I can't remember why I've got that in there, but there's probably a reason for it. <coughs> uh, you can have self-modifying code, but you have to copy your code into RAM in order to do that. So you would have to write a piece of code uh, and then move it into RAM and execute it there in order to do that. Um, but yeah, I mean, self-modifying code is something you probably avoid because it means you would have to copy it into another area. Then you'd have to, you'd have to give it pseudo origin code, like you would do, like with the pseudo PC stuff you would do in the Kick Assembler to make sure it runs as if it's in that new location, not the original location. Um, yeah, it's it's just it's not worth it. You may as well just write write better code. Um, the, the, the cool thing is is the number of registers you do have so you have I'll go through the registers in a minute uh, the number of registers that you have and the fact that you have 16-bit registers and um, a way to auto increment registers means you probably don't need self-modifying code quite as much um, so for instance one thing you might want to do in uh, 6502 is um, have a self-modifying lookup like this um, You know, and um, have a loop like that that, that goes through and, and kind of. I mean, this is very very simple, um, and then you can change this area here. But what you would do in Z80 is you would um, you would load HL, which is a special register, which I'll explain in a minute, um, with your address, um, and then you could do. Um, load accumulator with HL and then increment and what this will do um, it does the same thing that's happening here um, it increments it increments the value in HL every time um, but you can look up you can you can look up a value using a register as an indirect so this is kind of like indirect addressing um, I'll, I'll explain that a little bit when we get to something that uses that. So yeah, this is my asset file. At the moment, it's just got the character files in. I'm going to put things like my palettes and stuff in here at the moment. The hard-coded the palettes just because I, I just wanted to get them working. And until I get my uh, until I get my other thing going, um, so the um, the tile mapping stuff that I'm making. it runs you'll be able to export this tile map um, I mean you can already load them in so you'll be able to export this tile map 
um, and you'll be able to export these palettes as well in a format that I can import straight into into the game um, in here you'll also be able to import the tiles as well so the tiles as I say they're going to be two by two uh, characters so four characters for each one but also four attributes for each one so there'll be four characters and then four uh, attributes which will be things like which palette they need to use whether they should be uh, mirrored horizontally vertically um, and if you're using multiple um, multiple tile sets whether it uses the first or the second tile set um, I think there's another property now I can't remember what it is uh, actually we can have a look if we look in um, so we look in specifications uh, so you look under the VRAM stuff Hopefully it's in here. V RAM background map. Uh, uh, yeah, there you go. So, so this background map attribute. So this is like your color RAM. Um, you switch to the second bank, and then you write stuff to it. I'll, I'll, you'll see this in the code that does it. And you can you set three um, three bits for your palette, which is this one here. So that lets you pick from any of eight palettes for each character um, which bank it comes from so whether you're using this tar map or the other tar map as you can see in the um, in here so this is bank one this is bank two so if you had another tar map here you'd be able to switch between the two um, on the same screen as well so it's fine uh, once they're drawn into screen ramp um, you can have a mix of bank one and bank, bank zero characters in here um, whether you want to mirror it horizontally or vertically oh and also you can set individual characters background to foreground uh, background to sprite priority which means you can quite easily have sprites that go behind uh, trees but not anything else so that's kind of nice you can build um, quite nice layered backgrounds like that um, Okay, so that's that's the asset file. So as I say, there's not a lot in here yet. There will be eventually. Um, and then you have your entry point. Um, I mean, this this stuff can go anywhere because this actually is just more sections. So these these sections are an RGBDS thing. Um, they basically tell the assembler um, what we're building. You give it a name, so you can actually see that somewhere. I uh, see it here. Uh, if you switch the flag on, so if you set um, uh, which, which flag is it? It's one of these flags. I think it's B here, or I can't. I can't. It's one of these flags anyway. Um, we'll write this data out here, so you can actually see it being written out. Um, uh, so you can see these are the things I'm, I'm creating. Um, which area of memory you're putting it in? Um, so going back to this map here uh, you have ROM 0 which is this one here or ROM X which is this one here you think of it I'm, I'm thinking it of as ROM expanded so this is uh, where you would have anything that can be banked in and that starts at bank 1 uh, by default bank 1 is banked in um, and then from this point here so this is actually 150 here uh, not this like I said um, and I'm just including uh, some other files in here so I've got my initialized file which you can see I'm telling it goes in ROM 0 so what it does whenever it finds a directive and it says ROM 0 it appends it to the last ROM 0 so if you've got um, if you've got multiple ROM 0s they will just be appended one after another in, in memory in the order that they were read in so the first thing that goes into ROM 0 at, at 150 is this initialize routine which I'll explain shortly uh, and then my loader routine uh, which is my asset loading routine uh, and then the game code so this is the uh, this is the start point and this is where my entry point is here uh, so I think I, I think I can actually use JR here I don't think I have to use um, JP but so 
There are two jump instructions. There is a jump, which is synonymous to uh, JMP in 6502. And then there's jump relative. And jump relative works more like a branch instruction. Uh, you can say uh, it's more like a branch if equal, if always equal. So basically it, it, it's not doing any comparison here, it's just jumping. Uh, but it's relative, so this has actually got a 2 byte um, payload, uh, which is an address, uh, which is just this address here, whereas this is a relative payload, so it's a single 1 byte relative payload. Um, and that works a lot like um, the branch instructions, you can go 128 forward minus uh, 127 backwards or something like that. <coughs> Uh, so I'm using JP start because I don't know how big these are and these could grow over time so it's, it's very likely that the gap between here and here is going to grow to way more than um, 128 bytes. Hey Ferrari, welcome to the stream dude. I've got to say I really do like Iron Brew. It's a bit like Vimto. In fact it's very much like Vimto. <coughs> um, okay so let's go through um, let's go through the initial initialization code so uh, once you've loaded in stuff you can uh, I mean it wouldn't matter if I put these at the end I could put these down here if I wanted to and it would it would still work um, actually is it gonna work because I yeah it is work because I took that error out. It still works. It's just like it's just like six five zero two. It doesn't really matter where you include these things. Uh, the the labels that get created are still there. Um, <clears throat> so let's go through uh, init fonts first, which is the first thing. Oh, so call is basically the same as JSR. It's exactly the same thing. Um, it just calls the subroutine at this location. Um, actually, let's talk about the um, let's bring up initialize. Let's talk about the labels. Uh, so initialize fonts is here. Uh, so let me just put some space around it. There we go. Okay, so there's two types of labels. There's global labels and there's local labels. And this is a lot like Kick Assembler, where you have um, find a gap down here. Uh, you might have a, a label here. Let's call it global label. Uh, and this is on, on the root of the project, There's, it's not nested anywhere, it's, it's on the root of the project. But then if you do this, every label you now put in here is a local label. And what that means is I can, I can do this. Bear in mind this is kick assembler. And this is perfectly valid because even though there's two local labels, they're both contained within these global scopes. <coughs> and these, these brackets are what, what give you that. Um, if you were to get rid of these brackets, that would now fail in Kick Assembly because there's no there's no brackets to, to designate a new scope, um, and so it would just complain that there's two labels called local label, uh, which is why we have uh, we have the multi labels as well. So in Kick Assembly, we do this, um, and, and then that's valid again. So one of the things that's going to wind me up quite a lot in RGBDS is getting used to these these labels. So global labels have a colon on the end, and any labels that start with a dot after that. So let's have a look at the init font one. Any labels that start with a dot after that are, are local labels that belong to the last global label. So you can see here I've got loop two. Um, actually, if I put another loop two in here, that should still run without errors. Uh, yep, it does. And that's because even though there's, there's two loop twos, they belong to different global labels. There's no brackets to define the scope. It's just, it's implied when you create a global label, all the labels following that belong to that global label. Um, what that also means is you, I don't think anyway, there's a way of doing this. Um, you can't nest uh, scopes like you can in Kick Assembly. So in Kick Assembly, you could quite easily do uh, scope one, uh, and then in here you could do scope 2 uh, and you could have local 1 uh, you know you can you can nest scopes however you want and, and I think that's kind of nice don't ha don't seem to have that I might be wrong I've not looked into it into it in any detail <clears throat> the other annoying thing is if 
if you put any kind of indentation. Oh, it's actually worked. I didn't think that worked. Okay, maybe I'm wrong on that one then. I need to check that out. Um, I was under the impression that if you indented your labels, it wouldn't work, but maybe that's only global labels. Let's make sure that works. Yeah, it seems to be only global labels. Okay, just undo that for now. Um, so if I was to indent a global label, yeah, there you go. <coughs> so if I indent a global label, it doesn't work. So actually, we can kind of we can make this a little bit easier to read by indenting. So I'm going to do that now, actually. Um, uh, just indent all the code inside the global labels so that the local labels kind of stand out properly. Uh, I'll do it here as well. That's a relief. That makes life a little bit easier. I was beginning to worry about that a bit. I can do it on here as well. Yeah, it's, it's, I think once you get used to it, it's probably fine. It's just I've been using Kick for so long, it just seems weird to, to not be able to kind of indent how you like. Um, <clears throat> okay, so the first thing we call is init fonts, which is this one here. <clears throat> and the first thing that does is it waits for vblank. So remember what I said about you can't update anything in VRAM if the screen is being updated. So the easiest way to do that is just to wait for the the screen to get down to vblank because that means you get <coughs> oh god that means you get the biggest block of uninterrupted code um, that you can do things in um, and so the easiest way to do that is with this little function here so I created a small function um, and what this does is it, um, it loads the accumulator with RLY. See, I'm going to get rid of that now. I'm going to go find what that is and put it in because I need to learn what these values are instead of just relying on the includes. FF44, okay. So FF44, oh, comments are semicolon as well, which is another annoying thing, but I guess if you're used to TASM, then it's, it's fine. Um, So FF44 is our Rasseline line. This is basically um, D012 on the C64. So this is just tell it. This just gives you a number from uh, zero to 153. Uh, so you've got 144 lines, zero to 143, um, which are on the screen. And then at line 144 to 153, you're in the V blank area at the, at the bottom. It's only 10 lines, but it is it is quite a lot of cycles. <coughs> Um, so yeah, I'm loading the accumulator with that with the value that's in that location. So um, let's explain the Z80 a little bit here. So unlike um, the C64, where you have load and you have store, you just have load on the on the um, on the Z80. And what this does, I'm going to put in bring so load, and it's uh, the destination source it's always in that 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 format so you load your source into a destination and the destination can be um, a memory address it can be if it's a memory address you have to put it in in square brackets uh, let me let me do some examples here so um, if you want to load um, a value into a memory address then you have to put the memory address in brackets here square brackets and then what you want to load into it. and I believe you can only load the contents of the accumulator directly into a memory address um, I might be wrong on that though as well I'd need to check that um, if you want to load into a register then you put the register and then you can either put a value um, or if you put square brackets around it you can put you can load an address or you can load another register into the accumulator like that. There are D E F there are eight registers. So you've got 
Um, I'm going to do them in this order and you'll see why I do this in this order in a minute. So there is A, F, B, C, D, E, H, and L. And the reason they're in this order is because they also uh, form pairs um, and the pairs are like this. So on their own, they're 8-bit registers. So if I take, if I want to load the value uh, 8 into the accumulator, I would do that. And now I put the, the value 8 into the accumulator. And the same works for B, C, D, E, H, L. Um, I, there's something about F, I can't remember what it is, but there's some reason I don't, you don't use F, and I can't remember the exact reason what it is, but you tend not to use F. Um, the reason they're paired is because what you can do is you can put 16-bit values in. So if you wanted to put um, that value into BC, you can do it directly like this. So you can put a 16-bit value into BC. Now, I, I've heard in normal Z80 you can also do this which is you can load a 16-bit value starting at 1238 into BC. So look up the memory, look at the contents of 1238, puts that in B, I believe, uh, and looks at the contents of 1239 and puts that in C. You can't do that on the, on the um, Game Boy Z80. You have to load individually. So if you wanted to load, do the same thing, uh, you'd have to do this. You'd have to do... Uh, follow it but oops like that so you'd have to load them individually so these are the these are the little quirks that I, I guess you need to get used to I'm kind of lucky that I haven't done any Z80 before so I'm not gonna try and do things that um, I'm not gonna try and do things that I, I, I thought I could do because I, I don't know what I could do this is the first time I've used it I just know some of the intricacies of it um, so they're the registers. Um, the accumulator is the, the main one, the same as it is on um, the Commodore 64. The, re the accumulator register is the one that lets you do the bitwise operations, uh, lets you do uh, addition and subtraction. Um, uh, and I think it's the only one you can write directly into a memory address. I might be wrong on that. So this, this command here, I think is the only case where you can, you can do this. In fact, I mean, that wouldn't be this would write in some weird way because it's in that weird kind of HRAM area, but you know, something like that. Um, I don't think you can do this. I might be wrong. I'd have to I have to look that up. I think you can only do it with the accumulator. But what it does mean is you've got eight registers, so it's really nice. You can, you, I mean, compared to the three that you get on the CC4, it's really nice being able to mess around with more than three. Uh, although you do tend to need a bit, a few more. Um, so yeah, what we're going to do is we're going to load the value of uh, the raster line into um, the accumulator and then we're going to compare it to 144 and we're just going to wait, uh, we're just going to keep comparing it until it reaches 144 and if it doesn't we're going to go back to VBlank. I need to figure out this, I think this is carry set. Um, it doesn't actually say, I think it's if carry is set then go back here, which would imply that the comparison works the opposite way around to the C64, uh, in that if the number is less than, then the carry is set. If it's more than, then it's um, then it's cleared. Um, or if it's the same, I, I'm not sure how it works. I need to look at the flags and how they work. It's something I've just not investigated very much. Uh, but basically, this is just going to wait until we hit line 144, and it's just going to keep looping here until we hit that 144, which is the V blank area off the bottom here. And when it hits that, it's going to return from this function. So at this point here, now we are in uh, the V blank, and we can start messing around with the um, uh, with with the the VRAM, the display. Um, <coughs> one other thing you can do um, to ensure that you can write to VRAM is to disable the LCD. Now, VRAM is the the V blank is only ten lines down here, and the copy that we're going to do is probably going to take more than these ten lines. So we have to turn the LCD off. And we do that by loading the accumulator with zero. So this this command here um, is the equivalent of doing of doing this. But this is two bytes. This is one byte. Um, the reason this works is because it just it takes the contents of the accumulator and it scrutinizes it with itself, which is always going to give you zero. So this is a quick way 
uh, of loading the accumulator with zero. <coughs> and then we're going to store that value in LCD control, which I'm also going to grab out here, uh, which is this one, FF40. LCD control. And that's going to turn off um, the screen. So you can see in this list of bits here, um, LCD off is zero. So if we set zero in there, it will turn the LCD screen off. <coughs> and then at this point, um, at this point we can begin copying the font. So I don't know where copy font is. It's probably initialize. It's probably in loader. Where's my loader? Here it is. There we go. So we jump to this routine now. Um, so what does this do? Uh, okay, so this is the first first uh, instance of banking. So what we do is we ensure that the, the correct bank is being banked in and we do that by loading the bank number. So we're actually storing the bank number here. So the bank is in bank one. It says it here, but we, we just need a, a constant that we can use to ensure that if we do change this, we change it here and then it will work everywhere else in the game. Um, so we load the value of bank fonts. So this is basically loading one into the accumulator. And then we're going to store that into this ROM location. Now, remember what I said about you couldn't, because it's ROM, you can't write anything to it. Now, the Game Boy has, um, let me show you this area here. So the Game Boy has ROM all the way up to uh, 8FFF, uh, sorry, 7FFF. Um, however, if you write a value, into any location in lower ROM, um, I think from 2000 to 3FFF, it basically switches the bank for this one here. That's its only purpose. This could be 2000, it could be 3FF0, it doesn't matter. Any location in this, this area will switch the bank that's being used um, in this location, in this switchable ROM bank. So this is how we bank in um, the ROM that we need. So we're banking in this this piece of ROM here and then we need to copy the font so we use a 16-bit register uh, there is no no there is no LDIR command I don't even know what that is but I, I have seen the fact that it doesn't exist <clears throat> um, I don't know what that does is that load and load an increment or something like that is it something to do with indexing or I'm, I'm not sure what what that is this is a problem because I don't know Z80 I'm, I'm just going off what I've learned um, over the weekend uh, so to copy the font we basically we take one of the 16-bit uh, registers uh, DE we're going to use here and we load the address font tiles in there and that address is this here which is the beginning of our file we use ink bin so this is kind of like import binary uh, you know where we see that ink here, assembler uh, this is the same thing ink bin just loads this this block of characters into this memory location here we add the label font tiles font tiles and I'm actually going to change that because I do like to use this format for that so I know that it means end um, <clears throat> like that there we go um, <clears throat> so I'm loading in um, the the start address at DE um, I'm loading the address 9000 into HL and I'm loading the length of that font into uh, BC so now I've got three 16-bit values I've got the start address the death so this is our, um, our source uh, our destination and our length <clears throat> and then what I do is I load um, load the accumulator into so this is my loop here Thank you, Hassan, ha Hassan Ashkar. Welcome to the stream, dude. Our block move command. Yeah, so there are there are some other commands that let you do uh, block move stuff. Um, it's very specific to a certain area of memory. It's mainly used for updating um, sprite information, but they they do kind of exist. Um, but we do have load. Yeah, it's, we have this load increment and load decrement, which is what I'm going to show you now. <coughs> 
So we're going to load the accumulator um, with the first byte from our from our source. So these square brackets mean uh, grab the byte that's at this location. So we look in this we look in this uh, register pair and we get the source address and we go and look in the source address and we grab a single eight byte eight bit value from there and store it in the accumulator. And then what we do is this this command. So this is a GB specific command. Um, and this is load and increment. This is LDI, as uh, Fistmaster says. And the way it works is um, you load uh, whatever value you've got in the accumulator into the address pointed to by HL, so in this case our destination, which is 9000, and then you auto-increment the, the value that's in HL. So after the first, after this, HL equals 9001. So it's automatically incrementing uh, the value in HL. <coughs> uh, request a SID tune steps. Oh, I missed that one. I will put that on steps. The music has stopped completely, hasn't it? Let me put one on. Uh, we'll see requested. You have to you have to kind of shout at me if I miss the request. Tetris by Wally Babin. Okay. Tetris. Oh wow, this. Oh, there we go. Seems awfully quiet. So this this HLI this is a uh, uh, the LDI command. This um, basically allows you to, um, to 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 keep incrementing this value as we go along. Um, then the next line is, is similar to what we've seen in um, 6502, we increment a value, but with this time we're incrementing a 16-bit pair. I can't hear that music, by the way. I turned label requests off, Hayes. I turned them off because, can you imagine me trying to learn Z80 with you guys picking label names? Never get anything done. Music is very quiet. Now. Let me knock it up a bit. Oh, it's twenty-five minutes long. That's nice. Is that better? Um, yep, yeah, so we've we've read a byte in uh, from our destination, we've stored it uh, from our source, we've stored it at the destination. Uh, then we need to increase the, the, the source um, location. We can increment a 16-bit value, which is really nice. Um, we can also decrement a 16-bit value, so we decrement the, the length by one. Um, and then what we need to do is we need to make sure that this value has, has reached zero. And the easiest way to do that is to um, load one half of it into the accumulator, or it with the second half. If the result is zero, then both of them are zero. If any of them aren't zero, then it won't be zero. Um, you know, if you if you or two numbers and any of them is not zero, the result is non-zero. Uh, so only if both are zero uh, will this loop exit. So this is just basically going through copying from our from our source which is ROM here copying from this ROM and storing it in video RAM here which is our um, where was it I've got loads of these windows open there uh, storing it in uh, 9000 here so you can see it's copying the font into this location that's what it's doing it's just copying that char set directly into here um, and that's what this routine does, nice and simple, just grabs the assets, um, copies it from ROM into video RAM, and ready to go. Uh, no, it only works with HL. It only works with HL, unfortunately. I think so, anyway. Let me just, let me just check. If I was to make a change and do that instead, and then get rid of that, does that compile or does it fail? Oh no, that looks like it's... Oh, it does work, okay. I'm suspicious of that now.
It's also not highlighted properly here, so... See, it's gone really loud now. I'm going to check that. So the other place to check these things is on the RGBDS site because they do have a list of all the opcodes. Uh, where is it now? Uh, see if you instructions there. Here we go. So let's have a look. Load. No, I'm not. See, it looks like it worked, but it seems here that you can only do it with HL. And only on the destination, so I'm not sure why that's... Oh no, you can do it on the target as well. Well, where are you seeing the error? I'm not seeing the error. Oh yeah. Yeah, you are. See, I need to I need to fix this with colours. So I need to add some colour in, in in here and stuff. Um, but yeah, I think you can only do it with with HL. <clears throat> so you tend to use HL for doing your kind of memory copy, your increments or auto increment stuff. Accumulator for actually moving stuff um, from other registers so that you can do uh, maths and um, bitwise operations and also store it back into uh, memory locations as well you can see here um, I have to load the value into a uh, and then load that into here I can't do I can't do this for instance that won't work um, you have to use the accumulator as a kind of go-between <coughs> um, yeah okay um, so that's copying the font uh, and then this bit just copies the text so what I've got um, down here is uh, actually I've got hello world string which is the original string I got rid of that don't need that anymore um, I'm not going to go into too much detail about what this is doing but basically all I'm doing here is um, 9c100 is my screen RAM um, I'll show you on here So 9C100, if I select that in there, I make that bigger. My camera doesn't make the font any bigger, okay. Uh, this is this is my screen RAM, uh, and I'm basically copying, um, I'm copying data into it, but the first thing I do is I set a palette. So I switch to, so FF4F is um, a location which allows you to switch the the VRAM banks, so I'm switching to bank one instead of bank zero. I'm setting the palette for it, so I'm setting palette seven, this is three bits here. Um, if I set one of these bits, it will flip the font. See the font's back to front now. So this is this is like the color RAM. So I'm doing the color first here. Um, yeah, upside down. Then I load the accumulator with zero and I switch back to the char map and then I load um, I, I get the value in D I'm using D as, a, a, as an increment I'm just cycling through 0 to 255 um, and I store it um, to the screen and I increment the screen address as I go so basically um, as I go along I'm incrementing the sort the destination increment and a counter uh, and just storing that so it stores the entire font basically across the screen um, and I keep going until um, until H, so the upper byte reaches A0, which is the edge of the screen, um, which means I've reached the, the end point. It's not, sorry, not 256 bytes, it's 1024 bytes, so it's 32 by 32. Um, and then I do this comparison again, so I jump if the, if the carry is set. Um, I don't know if got, see I think this is I need to figure out the, the, the flags I think it's carry set not carry clear um, I need to I need to look up about these go back to them so I just repeat until the screen's full and then the last thing I do is I enable the screen again 
Um, but what I do here is I make sure that uh, this is like your D018. So this also, as well as turning the screen on and off, it tells you where the character set is, uh, where the tiles are, uh, and where the screen is as well. So, so changing these two bits here, three and four, changes the location of the of the screen ramp. And I saw that FFF40, which is the uh, the LCD thing, and that's the fonts initializer as as well as initializing the font. This is actually drawing it to the screen. This is just a, a test piece of code, so this will actually get removed. Um, it's just to put something on the screen so I can see it. Uh, then there's init sound. I haven't done anything with sound. The only thing I know how to do at the moment is to turn it off um, by putting zero in this location. I'm not going to change that label yet because I'm still not entirely. Oh, there you go. Oh, that's nice. Didn't know it did that. Okay, that's given me a reason to want to use the labels. Bit 7, all sound on off sets all registers to zero. That's really nice, actually. Shit, I now, now I feel like I need that. If I do that on here. Yeah, see, it doesn't quite work on that one, but it did on the other one. Is that because of something in here? Oh yeah, look. Interesting. Okay, so if you properly comment things, you can get you can get information. It's just a lot of it isn't commented. So, like, why would you not comment that? Look at that block of bits there. If only Shalan would teach how to do text on the C64. This is easy. Oh, you mean for the, the main screen? I told you how to do it. Just, just, uh, you need to, you need to basically copy the font data directly into a bitmap if you're using the bitmap. Let me know if the music is too loud. It seems getting louder and louder. Just gonna nudge it slightly. That's interesting. I, I feel like I need to make my own version of this. So I may make my own version of this hardware ink with my own details in here. Um, but I, th I guess what this also means is you can probably... Let me try something. If I just put... Um, if I do that here, and then I'll go in here. Ah, okay, cool. So one nice thing with this plugin is it will show you all the comments that come before. You have to do dash dash to make a new line. So, how do you get a new line then? Or does it just do it on? Okay, I need to figure that out, but that looks like it could be quite useful. The thing is, that I, I kind of want to keep, I want to learn the numbers, but at the same time, that's really useful. Maybe I'll do a combination of the two. Maybe I'll, I'll put the number in it or something. I don't know. Um, okay, you get headers and everything. Okay, cool. Right, I need to figure that out. Should it not be Game Boy music? Yeah, yeah. I, to be honest, this stream, I wasn't really prepared to do this stream. Um, but I did say that I would go through my kind of setup, so... <coughs> uh, no, I'm fine with this. This is good. You, you paid for it in your... In your um, your channel points. Uh, that's, well, that's complete. You've got a Last Ninja request coming up after this, so when this one is done, we'll put Last Ninja on. This is worse than the Doom stream. <laughs> Yet you're here. Yet here you are, enjoying it. 
Um, okay, cool. So that's the next sound. Thank you for the follow, Skyfox. Welcome to the stream, dude. And then a nip palette. So this is this is the tricky one. This took me a long time to figure out. Um, so, as I said before, you've got these two addresses, FF68 and FF69. So when you write a value into FF68, what you're basically telling the Game Boy is, um, the next value that I write into FF69 is, is going to be a palette value that goes in this location. Um, and you're also saying, when you've written that, increment the, the pointer so that the next value I write goes into the location after it. So I'm not going to go into too much detail about how, how this works, but I can probably share um, this code or, or something afterwards. Um, but basically it is taking the values from, from here, which are my palette values, and it's writing them into those addresses. Pardon me. And it's doing that by um, uh, reading the values um, from the font and in incrementing the, the kind of pointer as it goes along so it can increment along going through these so it reads these eight values in um, and then one by one uh, pushes them into ff um ff ff69 it actually writes a number into ff68 first then increments and starts loading values in um, oh what, another thing to note as well is the stack is 16 bit so you can you have push and pop which is the same as so so that's 6502 push uh, and that's 6502 pull in six in z80 it's push and pop um and you can't do it with a, 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 an 8-bit register so if i do that try and compile i should get an error um, yeah there you go i can't do that it has to be it has to be one of the 16-bit pairs and the pairs have to be in this order. Um, there we go. It's going to fail because because it's going to push and cause all sorts of weird things. But you can see it compiled fine. Um, so yeah, the, the the register pairs are AF, BC, DE, uh, and HL. I don't know why it's AF. There is a reason for it. I don't, there is a reason why you shouldn't use AF as a pair. It's fine to push it on and pull it on from the stack, but you shouldn't use it as a as a pair. You should use these three as, as pairs, A on its own. I, I'm not sure what you could do with the F register. I need to look look into that a little bit more. Um, but yeah, the stack is the stack is 16 bit, so you always push it. And you see here again. Um, so LCD weight. Um, this routine. I said, am I calling this? Yeah, I'm calling it here. So. Um, LCD weight is kind of similar to um, the V blank, but what it's doing is it's just making sure that you are not in any area where you're right into the screen or you're fetching for the screen on this side. Uh, and we do that by checking uh, a value in FF41. Um, and if the value, um, if this bit is set, the second bit, uh, bit one is set, um, then we're not ready. Um, and we just keep looping until that's happened. And that basically means we'll just about get off to the, either off to the edge of the screen here in the H blank, or we'll be down here in the, in the V blank. F is to show respect in chat, yeah. <clears throat> Isn't F the flag status radio? That's probably what it is, yeah. It's probably why I can't use it. I just know from, I, I, I've taken a lot of information in. Some of it's stuck and some of it hasn't. I, I need to go back and reread it um, to make sure. Uh, and that just initializes our palettes. Um, so if we change, so you can see here, I've, I've made a note of uh, how the palette is stored. So there's a blank byte at the beginning here. Then it's five bits for blue, five for green, five for red. So if I change this value here, this is our background color. So if I change them to all zeros, our background should go uh, black. Go. Uh, if I want it to be uh, kind of a yellow color, um, like so. Um, I'm trying to leave it on black. It's kind of what it's going to be. Um, so that loads the palettes in. 
Um, okay, I'm just going to go for a quick break. When I come back, I'll just explain the last little piece of code, which is the code that's going to do our scrolling across the screen. Um, and then I will... Uh, so on an interrupt, you push, pull, AF, because Z8 doesn't auto... Oh, God, really? Is that the case? Is that why I'm doing this here? Or is it? I think the reason I'm doing that here is because I need the accumulator value here. Um, let me check. Accumulator. Jump to loop two. Yeah, I need the accumulator value here, so that's why that's why this routine is pushing it because I need the accumulator in here. So this is just to store the accumulator. Um, but yeah, I didn't realize it doesn't store those. I've not done interrupts yet, so that's that's coming soon. Uh, I need to figure out how to do those. Because so I am going to need them to do palette switching on the fly. Um, can I do a palette switch? Uh, probably not. I probably need to do some other trickery to make the palette switch work in, in dock. Um, Okay, cool. Right, I'm going to go for a quick smoke. I'll be back in uh, two minutes, guys, and then we will go through the last little bit of code here. Uh, then I'll explain what my next steps are going to be and what do we, what we can expect next Tuesday. Um, all right, right back, guys. Right, and I'm back. Okay, if that explains all the setup files, let's just go through the last little bit of code so <laughs> um, I could store these values in 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 RAM but um, in, in this area here in my temporary which I think is what I originally was doing which is why I have this here um, but I've got lots of registers so what I do is I, I keep a timer um, in the B register pardon me and then the C register I um, pardon me god this I am bruised gassy the C register I stole the scroll position so remember when we were looking at this um, this scroll position here so you can see as it moves across the screen so this is scroll X um, and I, I stole that in, in zero <laughs> then uh, see now I feel like I do need this value here See, I need to go look at what that is now. All right, I'm going to start using the labels. Video RAM bank, okay. Let's put these in, god damn it. I was kind of wanting to learn the numbers, but I'll just... Yeah, okay, that's, that's better. I didn't know it did that. Now I know it does that, I, I can see the use of it. And it has the number here, so it's not too bad. Um, so I'm selecting video bank one. Actually, I don't need to do that at all. That's just a hang up from some code I was doing before. So I'll get rid of that. Yeah, still works, it's cool. So I am gonna set the background color to a different color because uh, I'm gonna do like a, a dark gray color, I guess. No, I'll sort of go, go with dark blue because the, the text is gray, so. Um, so what am I doing here? So I'm, I'm waiting for the raster line. Um, there we go. Yeah, look at that. That's good. It tells me where the V blank is as well. So I'm waiting for the V blank at 144. Um, yeah, actually, I should probably use hexadecimal. I prefer that. So I wait for the V blank. When we get to the V blank, um, we run this code. Otherwise, we just keep looping. Then when we do get to the V blank, I'm going to increment the value in the timer which is in the V register, put it into the accumulator, and it with 3F, and if that value is non-zero, uh, I'm gonna go to skip. So this is this is the same trick uh, that, we, that I've done in, um, uh, in, in uh, 6502 a lot, which is where I increment a value, uh, a timer value, and I load the timer. And then I land it with a value. Oh my God. So keeps trying to fill in Z8 here. Um, and then branch if not equal to skip. And this just makes sure that for uh, for 63 frames it does nothing. 
um, uh, and then on the 64th frame it does something and on the 64th frame it's going to increment our scroll position um, which is in C then we're going to load that value from C into the A so this is like doing uh, transfer X to A um, instead we're doing transfer C to A you do that again with the load instruction everything is with LD so you get used to this pretty quickly and then we store that at scroll X which is our oh, C I like that <coughs> You do this um, <coughs> with scroll X, which um, sets basically the position of it on the screen, uh, and and then I just repeat that. I just keep doing that and just keep incrementing the scroll position, and it creates that that kind of sliding thing there. So if I was to um, add another line in here uh, and load scroll Y uh, with accumulator, we should get a diagonal kind of scroll instead. Everything's gone correctly, which we do. There you go. So it's kind of nice. <clears throat> um, and that's it. That's that's as far as I've got. Um, I, I I stopped coding at this point and thought, okay, I kind of get the basics of Z80. I've, I've still got a lot to learn. Obviously, I need to figure out interrupts. Um, I need to understand Z80 in a little bit more detail. I need to understand the flags and how the flags, different flags work. Because um, this compare instruction seems backwards to me. Um, <clears throat> so I, I need to look into that. I need to figure that out. Um, but I, I, I knew enough that I, I knew enough about the IO registers that I could turn the screen on, draw stuff to the screen. I knew when to do it. Um, and I could I could boot it up and get it onto here. So um, I'll show you on here. Uh -huh. oh, did that, what did that do? Yeah, there you go. It's kind of hard to see, but you see the font moving around on there. And that's what I was after. I was just after something I could run on here. So once I got it running on here, I started looking at how I'm going to get my graphics over. <clears throat> and that's where I'm. That's where I'm at basically. So my, my next job is to go through um, this tile editor, get this tile editor to do everything I need it to do. I think I need probably another two or three nights work on it. Um, it's it's fairly close. Um, I mean, I can actually edit individual tiles now um, you know, I can I can edit a tile in here uh, and it will appear on here I can set palettes as well uh, so I can go in and yeah so I, I can I can mess around with a, a tile set now I'm going to create this meta tile thing so there's going to be four of these here so you can draw directly into a meta tile um, as well as a sign different palettes to each each section so each section will have a palette kind of uh, mark here to pick which palette you want to use for it as well as if you want it to be flipped or not um, and yeah and just build those and then then so that I'll probably finish tomorrow night Thursday night I'm gonna do uh, vertical scrolling on the C64 um, <clears throat> so that will be um, that will be Thursday night then I think hopefully on Friday night I can finish this off if not Friday night Saturday um, which will be uh, another window here which will be the maps so you'll, you'll just have one really massive map which you'll be able to view a section of uh, kind of like you can see in the uh, uh, In the VRAM viewer here, so you'll you'll have a large map like this that you can draw tiles into, um, but it would be bigger than this. But you'll you'll have a, a view that you can see at any one time, uh, and you'll be able to divide the screen into any size that you want. Uh, so the the Game Boy screen is 20 by 18. Um, I'm going to make the maps 20 by 16 per screen. Um, <clears throat> um, so that gives me two, as well, just to show you that picture again, it gives me two lines that I can actually use to do. So these two lines here are going to be uh, used to draw the hood at the bottom. 
uh, and then this will be tw 20 by 16 so it'll be 10 10 by 8 tiles meta tiles um, which means I've got room for 256 meta tiles I'm probably not gonna need that many to be honest um, but you'll be able to draw them all in this and then kind of export them as individual maps um, possibly with um, possibly with uh, run length encoding although to be honest with the amount of memory two megabytes of memory on the cartridge i'm probably not even going to need that um, the tricky thing is going to be doing um, uh, the tricky thing is going to be doing uh, sound drivers as well so i've got to figure out how to do um that's not is it where's it gone i've got to figure out how to use these registers uh, to create a sound driver i'm hoping there's there's some kind of tool out there like goat tracker that will output runnable code but i'm not holding my breath so um i'm i, I need to investigate I, i've not i've not looked into sound yet but it's definitely something we i need to get in i need a very specific kind of sound driver as well because i need to be able to switch everything into a very basic mode so play the same tune but with the same same ba very basic instrument um oh hi old school coder you missed the setup uh is that typescript no this is uh just js just es6 or whatever it is to be honest, i've lost track of what they call it now um very messy es6 at that but uh it's react um uh it's react uh, for the front end and then node for the uh, for the electron app so there's a there's an app um, that runs it as a desktop app like this um, which gives me you know save functionality and you know, gives me those kind of things so yeah it's it's node node and um, uh, node and react node.js and js plus react it's not in a browser it kind of is in a browser so electron is just uh, chrome wrapped in a desktop app um, so this is a standalone app but it actually has a browser in it, which is why you've got the you've got the standard kind of debug tools in here um, which obviously when I ship a production version these will get turned off um, uh, but it's it's nice because you can you know I can I can go in here and I can style things um, quite easily using CSS which is nice so I can I can look in here and I can mess around with the CSS and create my styles it's it's quite nice <clears throat> so yeah it is it is a browser essentially um, <clears throat> but it's pretty good so yeah it's pretty pretty easy to use you still say you use Python you would say that though Andy is the Python fan aren't you um, it works really well. I mean, Electron, Electron is is nice. There, there are better things to use than Electron, but I've just used it so much. It's just kind of, uh, it's just become second nature. It's, if I'm writing something, I can just pick this up pretty quickly and throw something together. So this only took me, uh, what, maybe two hours or so to do. Um, not, not too long. And to be honest, most of that was trying to figure out how to get the the data from YHR this thing to work in here um, so I've got these I've got the original file which I did here which is in 2-bit Game Boy format so working out how to get the data from here into here um, once I work that format it's pretty easy I know everything else is just this is just a canvas that you can draw on and when you let go of the mouse it updates in here uh, these are react components that you can download very easy to to find um i was going to roll my own one of these and thought there's no point i might as well just use an rgb component uh, and just strip it down so <clears throat> in this case this is the red i've selected here uh the the rgb 555 version of this would be uh d8 1818 i mean you know you can't you can't really tell the difference uh, you'd have to be very very kind of good eye to notice the difference between that red and that red they look identical to me <coughs> um, so yeah I'm just uh, when when you go to export the palettes it will convert them into RGB 555 um, uh, 
think that's about it. I don't really have much more to show you at the moment. Hopefully next week I'll start creating a map. So I'll create a couple of couple of screens in here um, and we'll go through writing the code to get them to display. Um, uh, <laughs> it's 8 bit eyes confirmed. Uh, one is blood of mine enemies and one is cheap Tesco <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, I I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be able to notice the difference, and and for for what I need, I don't need I, I don't need to be that that, um, that accurate. I mean, this is 15 bit color is still pretty pretty good. I mean, it's still 32,000 colors, um, which is a lot, really. I mean, yes, there's only going to be 32 at once on the screen. I don't think I'm going to do any palette switching tricks. Um, uh, actually, there'll be 32 for the background and 32 for the sprite, so there could technically be 64 different colors on the screen. Um, oh yeah, let's let's. So somebody posted another track. Let's have a listen to that one. Uh, who was it? It was Fistmaster. Uh, oh, Rain's Last Ninja Three intro. Yeah, it has finished. God, that was a long track, wasn't it? Ninja uh, Let's just go through them all Okay, don't know what that was I think some of these are just sound effects. But yeah, I mean, if you look at if you look at the ah, oh, it's wind. Okay, is this just the same all the way through? I guess it is, isn't it? Let me skip to the next track. Oh, that wasn't it. There we go. So you look at that, and you compare that to. Uh, C64 original. Uh... Oh, it does it. Okay, let me skip back. Oh, it's two different tracks, weirdly. There we go. Play it properly. We shrink this down to kind of similar size. So there you go. I, I kind of like the look of it. It's got it's got the same feel to it, um, but just higher resolution which is kind of nice, it doesn't look too bad at all. It's a pretty impressive wind effect actually. Yeah, C64 definitely has more space. Um, I mean technically it's twice as wide um, because the screen's a lot higher as well so if I, if I bring it to kind of roughly the same uh, Yeah, that's even that's a bit too small. It's more like yeah. So I, I am gonna have to take some kind of liberties with the design a little bit, but because I'm I'm kind of redoing the, the levels a little bit, uh, it it should be should be fine. Some screens I, I may split into two, some I may just shorten a little bit. Uh, the map will be a bit different. Uh, the basic flow of the first maybe two thirds of the game will be the same, and then the the, the last third will probably be replaced by um, new challenges. Because as I say, I had to kind of 
had to trim down the the, the, the second half of the, the the last third of the game on here. Um, so the bit so the bit where you come up here and here, there was a whole section round here um, that I had to get rid of. So you just kind of walk along and then come up here. Um, but I had to get rid of all of this section, so that that will be replaced. Um, but I, I think I, I mean, what do you think, guys? I think that kind of looks pretty pretty decent. Um, I need to get my lighting right. Um, the lighting's good on the rocks, but it's kind of a bit weird on these these things. So I'm going to probably edit those a little bit. Also, uh, Doc is going to be a little bit slimmer in this version, uh, just because of the size of the screen. Um, he's gonna. He's just gonna be. It's probably gonna be the same sprite, but um, every double pixel will be a single pixel, so it'll just seem a little bit, bit skinnier. I think so. Um, I'm gonna try and keep some of the same effects in. So I'm gonna have the screen scrolling for this initial level. I might have moving stars in the background because I have got 40 sprites to mess with, so um, it should be pretty easy to do. Um, and I'm just going to try and add more colouring. So I'm trying to, with the palettes like here, these green things. I've got a, I've got one of the palettes is lots of shades of green. The dog go vegetarian and lose weight. <laughs> he is a bit chunky, isn't he? Um, yeah, he's probably gonna, he's gonna get a bit of a, go on a bit of a diet for this. Um, I've got to work out how to do things like animate. Um, these bits here and I think I can mess around with palettes here to kind of make the background flicker and stuff but um, yeah it's, it's gonna be interesting I, I don't think it'll take too long to do because the game design is pretty much there already I know everything that needs to go in um, it's not a complicated game really uh, once you once you've got the the timeline effect in it's not it's not that complicated at all this is a pretty epic tune actually I like it Yeah, the speedrun glitch will be done as well. So the speedrun glitch is um, a hang-up of um, of there being uh, using hardware sprite collision. So um, that that won't be there in, in this one. Uh, and and I'm hoping to make it a little bit longer. I'd say probably about fifty percent longer than it is now. So it should take about half an hour, forty-five minutes to complete if you know where you're going, and you can do it without dying. Um, and because I've got plenty of memory to mess around with, um, I can be a bit more generous with things like extra lives and stuff. Because every extra life I put in was another few bytes that I had to use, and, and I think the final version was two bytes short of filling the cartridge. So um, after compression as well. So, uh, but this is kind of what I'm aiming for. I've got to redo it because I lost the the tile set that I did for this in a stupid accident with this clunky tool so I was trying to what was I doing it was some, it was in one of these menus somewhere I was trying to trying to load a bitmap and I ended up saving over my, my other thing so that's a very good tune this this is the guy that did um, I think it's this guy anyway that did Flimbo's quest isn't it that's an excellent track Oh, missing a message here. Uh, oh, it's from Andy regarding LDIR. LDIR takes H as a destination, BC as a source, some as a counter, probably, and then do another block over there. Let me just don't come in blister really fast for an 8 bit. Uh, okay, yeah. Yeah, it's um, there is a, a, a an option. I can't remember what it is now. I'm going to see if I can find it. Um, Oh, this is a nice one as well. So uh, what this does is it swaps the two nibbles in a byte. So quite often um, you will store two pieces of information in a byte, uh, one in the upper four bits, one in the lower four bits. Um, this swap is a really quick way of switching those two nibbles over. So if you want to quickly test um, the upper four bits of something, it lets you swap the two nibbles really quickly. 
swap the two nipples. <laughs> uh, yeah, I love the, the Flimbo's quest music, it's awesome. Uh, where is the extra command? So there is another site that I was looking at, um, which is this one, I think. It's a little bit hectic, and I mean, it looks like, I don't know, I mean, the guy is obviously not a web designer, because uh, those colours are horrific. Um, but it is full of quite interesting information. Actually, this one thing I do like about this site is if you, if you just want to learn assembly for, for a platform, He's got tutorials for pretty much everything. Um, so you can learn kind of just chipsets or you can learn individual computers as well. Um, but he's got he's got a lot of stuff in here. Uh, so this guy kind of knows his stuff and he, he goes into quite a lot of detail. I find his tutorials a little bit tricky to follow. I don't know if it's the, the style of the, um, I, I don't know, it's just a little bit tricky to, to kind of get to grips with. Um, but there is some interesting information in there. Um, you just have to dig for it, really. Um, but this is what this is how I learned the palette stuff through this site after a lot of pissing around with it. Uh, he goes fast. Yeah, he does go fast. I, I was reading, uh, sorry, watching one of his. Um, one of his videos on the, on the Game Boy, and it was it was hard to follow, very hard to follow. Um, but I, I kind of got there in the end. But it's uh, it's a good site. It's got some interesting information. So what I was going to look for was um, uh, all this stuff. Where is it? That's the fast one. No, it doesn't even explain it in here. There is a way of doing a really fast copy, um, but I cannot remember what the hell it was. Uh, as I say, it's difficult to find on this guy's site. Um, <coughs> Basically, it's like a block copy. Um, oh, maybe it's this thing. It's LD. Oh no, that's that's like a zero page load. So it's called high RAM instead of zero page. Uh, jump restore stack operations. No stack operations. I think it's these things. God, now this is all. See, I need to learn. I need to learn about these things. Set carry flag, okay. So I'd be clear carry flag, I imagine. Disable interrupt, enable interrupt. What's that? Decimal module. All right, to convert to BCD. Uh, I'm not seeing where this instruction is, but there is there is an instruction that will. Uh, I think it takes like a hundred, maybe if I search for 160. No. Okay, glory Z80 60 cycle. <sighs> OAM DMA, that's the one. It's not a single instruction. Uh, oh no, it is a single instruction. Okay, so you basically give it a destination and then you enable DMA and then it takes 160 cycles, 160 microseconds to copy 160 bytes into into sprite ram so i think it's intended for kind of um you remember what i said about you couldn't edit sprite data 
um, while the screen's rendering. So what you would do is you would store that sprite data in some other register somewhere, some other RAM location. Um, and then when you get into vblank, you would copy that to the new to to sprite um, uh, to the object attribute memory, the OAM, um, and that's 160 bytes, 40 sprites, four bytes each. Uh, and this routine will do it quickly for you, so it's super fast. So that's the closest you get to to that kind of uh, that sort of thing. Um, that's pretty good. It's one one cycle per byte copied, so. Uh, thank you for the follow, Copper Tend. Welcome to the stream, dude. Um, I think we're just about to end there, to be honest. I can't think of anything else I need to, to go through. Um, maybe I can share some of the some of the sites I've been looking at. So um, this was another site that I looked at. This was this helped me kind of understand. Um, I'm going to post these into chat. This helped me understand the um, the byte registers, uh, sorry, the uh, palette registers a little bit. Um, a combination of this and the other guy's site was what I used to to figure it out. Um, this this bit here. Uh, it took a little bit of adjustment to get it to work for me, but um, figured it out nonetheless. Actually, it does have. He does have this OAM buffer as well, so he's showing how that works. So the DMA stuff, the very quick copy, that's kind of cool. So that's that's kind of a useful site. Um, there was this one as well, which was um, what I kind of read just to get to grips with. Yeah, I'll, I'll stick these in Discord afterwards. That's a good idea, I can think. Um, so this is the one I read. To, to basically learn GBZ80, so it goes through kind of uh, you know introduction to the Game Boy, um, and then goes through the kind of syntax and, and the registers. I, I need to read through this again because I think I've kind of I've, I've forgotten some of the stuff, um, so I need to just kind of remember, uh, go through this once more and, and learn it. Uh, it also has some stuff on. Uh, interrupts here as well which I need to read I've not done this yet um, it also explains the, the memory the, the memory is another thing I think I probably need to read again I think I've got the hang of it now um, it's all about banking in ROM and RAM at the right times I probably don't need to bank RAM in I think uh, I think what is it 16 kilobytes of RAM is probably enough no not 16 kilobytes what have I got I think about eight kilobytes. I forgot. I've got uh, yeah, eight kilobytes here. I think that's probably enough. I mean, I don't need a lot of RAM, um, and if I did, it would be. In fact, there's RAM here as well. Um, but this is the bankable one, or is that the bankable? I think this is the bankable one. This is the one that can save. Um, yeah, save RAM. Um, it's it's the one that's on the cartridge not inside the machine so this is actually built into your your Game Boy cartridges uh, this is where when you get a battery inside them that's what it's doing is it's, it's retaining the, the values in in, um, in SRAM um, and then this just says not finished so I'll, I'll put these into discord later uh, I think that's pretty much it there's not much more in there uh, what's that one there? Oh, this I started looking at the music, so I found a list of lots of trackers. But I don't know how any of these actually can output um, output usable files, or if uh, if I just have to kind of write my own. I have a feeling I'm going to have to write my own driver, but that's that's fine. What I might do is write something that can play Goat Tracker data files, um, because I need to take the sound from the music from Doc and put it into a game. So I'd, I'd like someone that uses Goat Tracker's kind of files somehow. Um, I don't even know how that's going to work because it's it's a little bit different. The sound chip is two pulse waves, um, a wave which is you can define any wave you want. So you can define a sine wave, you can define a sawtooth, you can actually use it for um, for samples as well. 
and then a noise channel as well which has got I think it's got 8-bit and 16-bit noise so one sounds kind of quite computerized and kind of glitchy which is the 8-bit one and then you've got a 16-bit noise which is kind of similar to what you hear on the C64 um, yeah that's a, that's a whole different thing I've not even thought about that <coughs> um, Yeah, so I've not gone. I, I, I'll put a link to these. As, I'll put a link to all of these in. Uh, and there's a forum here as well. Um, actually, is that, that's not the forum, is it? Oh, that is a forum. Oh no, this is just a list of links, and then there's a forum here as well. So um, there's a lot of stuff there. I'll, I'll, I'll put links to these. Do you wish CC400 Z80? God, no, not at all. Not at all. The only thing I think would be really, really useful is 16-bit register pairs. That's that's the one thing I think the 6502 is desperately lacking. Um, being able to combine two register, but I mean, can you imagine if you did that on the C64? What would you have? You've had you'd have X Y. That's it. You'd have one 16-bit pair, which would be X Y, and um, <laughs> then that leaves you with only one register left: one one 8-bit and one 16-bit register. Um, but to be honest with you, I think I, I think if you get used to six five zero two three is is I don't, I don't want to say it's not enough. Um, uh, I don't want to say it's enough because it's not. But um, you can you can learn to kind of work with it and and use zero page and and stuff like that. So I'm pretty sure that the way Z eighty works, I'm going to run out of registers all the time doing these things. Um, I mean, right in this BG palette thing, I think I used, let's see, I used A, D, E, H, L, C. So I didn't use B, but I used everything else. So I used all but one register here, and I actually had to push some onto the stack to get them back twice. So, yeah. Um, okay. I'm going to call it there then guys it's been interesting Tuesday night stream it's a little bit different um, I'm going to do this hopefully again next Tuesday um, I should have that I should have this done by then I mean this is this is really close now I've got the bulk of the difficult stuff done I just need to get all the saving features and a few nice tools like flipping stuff um, and then I think once I've done dock I will share this tool as well because I think it's pretty good I mean if you're into Game Boy Color development it's pretty useful um, I might add export tools to export for NES as well um, because I think NES and Game Boy are probably the two that it'd be most useful for um, all right let's have a look let's see we can raid I'm not used to seeing people on Tuesday so I don't know who who is around um, let's have a look uh, oh wow, nobody. Anybody got any ideas who to raid? I don't have any. See, you can tell I don't. I don't stream on a Tuesday. Raid Aquas. 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 I know. Is that the guy with the? I always think of it. Uh, I don't know who that is actually. <coughs> All right, let's raid Aquas. Oh, Hot Shots Golf. Oh my god, I remember this game. It's an awesome game. <coughs> god, yeah, I remember playing that. Alright, let's go. Let's raid him because um, that's quite cool. Um, and I shall see you guys on Thursday. So, on Thursday, we're going to do um, vertical scrolling on the C64. Um, hopefully, we'll get it going in both directions. Um, I need to think about the approach for it because um, I don't I haven't really thought about what to demonstrate uh, or anything I know kind of the technical stuff but I want something that you guys can take and use as a base for stuff so um, <coughs> hopefully we'll get that get that going on Thursday no problem and then back to back to the game on Saturday we start filling out those uh, those kind of game flow screens intro title screen and stuff like that uh, 
who Aquas is going to finish soon. All right, let's raid him quickly though, because I, I need to get some sleep as well. All right, good night, guys, and uh, thanks for joining the stream, and I shall see you on Thursday. Take care. Bye.